day one. I have never before in my life kept a diary of my thoughts. And here, at the start of my tenth decade, having for the moment nothing much else to write, I'm having a go at it. Good luck to me. The first thought that strikes me as being worth memorialising entered my mind today as I drove my dear old Honda Civic Type R, an old friend, into Port Maddock. And on the radio, somebody was playing a piano concerto. I sort of knew the tune, but only just. And perhaps what I was remembering came from some other composition altogether. Then it occurred to me how amazing it is that there are still enough unused groupings of musical notes for people to write yet more piano concertos. Won't they ever run out? And isn't it amazing? that they are still all too familiar combinations of notes or harmonies, ones I know all too well, that can still bring the tears to my eyes, especially when I'm alone driving my car. Nobody to break the spell, I suppose, and the music slides in unaware, like another old friend, reminding me of half-forgotten emotions. Day Two in our anguished world of the 21st century, when the United States of America I've long cherished is subsumed like everywhere else in squalor and disillusion, I often look back nostalgically to the America I first knew, essentially, in my memory, small-town America. I got to know scores of little towns then, scattered across the entire subcontinent, I had a home for a time in one of them. They were invariably welcoming, almost invariably frank, simple in their loyalties and, well, very nice. In those days, of course, sixty or seventy years ago, the mystique of the American small town was more fashionable. Thornton Wilder had made it so with his play, Our Town and popular songs often serenaded it. I am older and more cynical now, but I still prefer to remember those old stereotypes, with the housewives nattering, and the swanky young blood showing off when the town pond froze at Christmas. With those fond, fanciful memories, too, went a related patriotism, bold but genial to which I happily subscribed. As a national heritage, I am devoted to my own British past because I like the colour and eccentricity of it, the effrontery, the mixture of greed and benevolence, the admirable, the unforgivable, the bombast and the humour, all of which is still best expressed, I think, by the ambiguous epic of the late British Empire, to which I have devoted much of my life. But the Pax Britannica was, of course, famously nationalistic. And when it comes to a profounder kind of patriotism, it strikes me that the old American sort was far grander and truer, based not upon triumphs, but upon the original generous values of the Republic. If I were to choose a new national anthem for the USA... I would choose the words by Emma Lazarus that are inscribed upon the plinth of the Statue of Liberty. They welcome the world's masses, tired, hungry, and oppressed, through the golden gates to freedom. And I would sing them to the setting written in 1949 by a refugee from Russian Siberia. And I would have it sung, if possible, by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir of Salt Lake City, who originally modelled themselves, wait for it, upon the male voice choirs of my own dear Wales. <laughs> Day 16. I have always rather envied the poet Ovid, who was banished from Rome by the Emperor Augustus, you may remember, to a remote place called Tomis on the shores of the Black Sea. There he died, ten years later, and his exile has gone into legend 
and into art. Turner's commemoration of his fate is as poignantly dramatic as the fighting Temeraire. Ovid wrote prodigiously during his banishment, and although his work was mostly sad and often complaining, as a remote member of the same fraternity, I find it hard to commiserate with him. There are worse predicaments, it seems to me, than enforced residence in a house on the Black Sea, writing lyric poetry for the rest of your life. My own Thomas is our garden at Hlanistumdwi, Wales. It is Elizabeth's domain. She created it and attends it still. I just laze about in it, thinking up compositions, Ovid-like. It is a patch of gravel overlooked on three sides by a tangled mass of trees and bushes, a fir or two, a horse chestnut, rhododendrons, bushes of camellia interspersed with blackberry brambles, shrubs I don't know the names of, primroses, bluebells and snowdrops when the season allows, miscellaneous weeds here and there that Elizabeth heroically resists. The whole ensemble is presided over by a splendid old sycamore dominating the skyline. I must not make it sound too grand. It is essentially homely, and its fascination for me is that it's not just home for us, but for a myriad of other creatures. I love to think about the livestock similarly living, eating, fighting, procreating, and dying in and around the yard all around me, as I laze there in the sunshine, and Elizabeth deals with the weeds. Butterflies visit me as I laze. Bees and wasps buzz around, beetles and caterpillars make for the gravel. Sometimes a handsome dragonfly comes up from the river or a robin hops in. Sometimes coveys of seagulls from Cardigan Bay pass overhead on their way to a promising harvesting somewhere. Our owls are still asleep, I suppose but I like to think of them anyway, there in the dark of the woods. Ah, but here comes our merry postman with his morning consignment of trash. Elizabeth drops her trowel and pops off to make some coffee, and I pull myself together, stretch, send my respectful regards to Ovid and the Emperor, and leave the yard to the rest of them. Day Eighteen. I have lately been the subject of a television programme, presided over by one of the best-known and best-loved professionals in the business, and the effect on me has been disastrous. I have lived in this corner of Wales for seventy years, and my family and I can't go shopping without bumping into old acquaintances, one of the delights of Wales, anyway, is its organic sense of comradeship. Appearing on TV, though, seduced me into altogether different sensations. Suddenly, I felt all those familiar people treated me in quite a new way. They seemed to me actually eager to say hello, as though my appearance on the screen beside that universally admired personality had somehow anointed me with an unction. It was as though they were greeting an altogether new me. And a new me it was, alas. Not them. Me. Something of the dross of television had rubbed off on me, the tinsel magic of it and the awful distortions of celebrity. I found I was actually offended if somebody didn't mention that TV programme, which I hadn't even seen myself, and actually disturbed if somebody didn't recognise me at all. But it soon wore off. Things got back to normal, and people no longer seemed to prepare their smiles for me as I approached them down the road. In the end, I actually saw the programme myself, and what did I see? Through the eyes of candour, 
I saw a very old woman in yellow, shuffling. Day 20. My basic form of daily exercise is this. I walk for a thousand paces up and down the lane beside our house, rain, shine or earthquake. I do it at a fairly brisk march, sustained by the discipline of rhythmic breathing and by whistling, singing, humming or just imagining suitably pulsating works of music. My mental repertoire of these is wide, from Men of Harlech to Mozart's Dies Rey. Preoccupied as I am during my daily exercise up our lane, eyes on the ground, thinking about something else altogether, I seldom know exactly where I am on the route. Kind nature, though, has provided a key to let me know when it is time to turn around and walk home again. The lane runs parallel with a little river, Duivor, with some woodlands in between, and unless after rainfall the water is running very high... I hear nothing of it for the first half mile. Then the lane leaves the woodland and the river grows closer and for the first time I am conscious of the rush of its stream. Without a pause, I turn at once and begin my homeward march. Day 24 Do you remember India's Grand Trunk Road, as Kipling described it in Kim? A wonderful spectacle. A river of life, green-arched, shade-flecked, the white breath speckled with slow-pacing folk. Well, I saw it for myself this evening, looking along our lane to the farmyard. It was a jammed little cameo up there, half in shade, framed by the thick green trees of our avenue, and it seemed to be in slow, stately movement along the great highway, somewhere between Allahabad and Amritsar, perhaps. There were a dominant couple of elephants, laboriously swaying, and coveys of peasants jostled along the pavements, and I could hear laughter sometimes, and see a pie dog scurrying mischievously here and there amongst the dust clouds. High-wheeled wagons were edging their way through the melee. Once, a small, busy rickshaw darted in and out of the traffic. Oh, I could see all the colours of India along there, and smell its smells, and hear the reedy half-tones of its music magically in the air, for it was five o'clock, you see. And my neighbours, the Barrys, were taking their Hereford cows in for milking riding their quad bikes with Ben the dog scampering all around. The pace was unhurried. The light flickered with floating oak leaves. The dust was hay dust. It was me, really, whistling those arcane melodies. And that bustling rickshaw was only my own Honda, hurrying me home to tea from the supermarket bazaar. Day 30. The sea. The sea. There is a place on the A497, not far from my house, where motorists coming from England can see at last, as they cross a gentle mound in the road, the waters of Cardigan Bay. If there are children in the car, as likely as not, it is the first time they've set eyes on the sea. And I love to see them as they pass, jumping up and down with excitement and crying, I love to suppose, Thalassa, Thalassa, as did Xenophon's Greeks when they reached the shore of their homeland at last. I know just how they felt, both the Greeks and the children. I have lived almost all my life beside the sea. Most of the books I have written have been about sea cities, Venice, Manhattan, Sydney, Trieste. And I always felt, writing about dear old Oxford, that the one thing it lacked was a beach. The sea itself was a sort of homeland for me. And nowadays I can hardly imagine life far from a shoreline. Life without an open border, without a horizon, as it were, without that sense of 
wider meanings that the ocean provides. To be honest, I've never read Xenophon, so it has ignorantly occurred to me to wonder which was the particular bit of sea that his Greeks reached that day, two thousand years ago. I'd always assumed that it was the Aegean or the Ionian. It was not. It was the Black Sea. I looked again at my own globe, and of course there at the bottom of the Black Sea was the Lesser Sea of Marmara, and at the bottom of that the fateful Strait of the Dardanelles, which connected its waters uninterrupted, not just with the Aegean or the Mediterranean, but with all the other seas everywhere on earth. Even sending a drop or two, I like to suppose, together with a fraternal whisper of Xenophon to the far waters of Cardigan Bay, which I can see from my window as I write. Day 31. Scenes of family life. A daughter complained, almost in tears, that the work on her house had been wretchedly half-completed. A son reported, almost in despair, an unwelcome development in his marital affairs. A grandson said he would like to murder the man who invented homework. A son sent us a poster of his poetical and musical festival in the Albuchara Mountains. A son sent us a photograph of a horned owl in his garden in Alberta. A daughter sent us animal pictures she had taken in Kenya. A grandson sent us underwater photographs he took in Portsmouth Harbour. A son left on the kitchen table a delicious risotto to heat up for our supper. A very small granddaughter knocked on the door with a peculiar cake she had made with her own hands. A larger granddaughter reported that her new school wasn't too bad after all. A ginger cat popped in from somewhere. Nothing to do with us. A son popped in too, out of the dusk, just to see if we were okay. So it goes, the diurnal sequence, bad and good, happy and unhappy, to outlast us in all our generations. Day 41. Fact or Fiction? As an old pro of the writing game, I don't recognise the distinction. The two kinds are irrevocably mingled in my own work. The thing is, truth is not absolute. It's all in the mind. For centuries, it was absolutely true that the earth was flat. I do admit, though, that I have occasionally written things that are demonstrably and permanently untrue. I once reminisced romantically about an evening in Australia when the great wings of the Sydney Opera House, I wrote, soared like a benediction over our content. It did not soar over us at all, I later realised, because the Sydney Opera House hadn't been built yet. But as for a subtler kind of truth, the inner kind that is seminal and personal to every one of us, I will defend to the death my right to exploit it. What I see in a picture, or a place, or a face, or even an event, is not necessarily what you see. It is my truth I am recording. People sometimes complain to me about it. My memory of Oxford or Trieste, or Rourke's Drift, or the Kentucky Derby, they maddeningly say, is not in the least like the evocation of it in your book. Well, of course it isn't. I always feel like replying, you didn't write the book, my mind is in your mind. But I never do. I know what they mean. The oafs. Day 42. I slept badly last night having had trouble meeting the deadline for an essay I was writing, and so I fell into a sort of half-dream, a technique I've evolved for the purpose of recording these thoughts. I imagined myself seeing the Earth as a whole, as astronauts do from space, and layer by layer, as I approached it, analysing its condition. First, there was a universal stratum of decline, 
the general corruption of air and atmosphere, the filth of the seas, the vanishing wildlife and all that. Then, layer down, I reached the frightful confusion of human enmities that seemed to be becoming permanent with all its ancillaries of racism and spite, from refugee drownings to nuclear threats, starvation to cruelty to plain bigotry. Closer to home, what decency could I see down there? Only a welter of political and financial ambition, greed, moral degradation, a morass of uncertainty enveloping all the nations and fostering bitterness everywhere in democracies as in despotisms. And finally, I reached my own sweet home amongst my friends in the country I loved. And I forgot about my unfinished essay, then turned over and went to sleep. Day 43. Home, James, and don't spare the horses. The phrase pursued me for years, in the days when I was still called James myself, and it made me wonder how many of the catchphrases of my time are still active or even remembered. Home, James, I discovered, has got into the dictionaries if only because legend attributes it to Queen Victoria addressing a favoured coachman. It's certainly true that if I say to my twelve-year-old granddaughter, see you about, trout, she may well retort, see you later, alligator. But I'm fairly certain that if I said to somebody, cheerio, I would not get the retort, pip-pip, which was common enough in my youth. Day 44. There is much to be said for nostalgia. It can be debilitating, I know, but it can be agreeable too especially when one reaches the years of discretion, and I spend much of my time wallowing in it. In misty panorama, the years and the places pass through my inner vision, and I remember events I have completely forgotten, see cities I can no longer identify, and even sense lost fragrances and seminal emotions. Memories, memories. They may be blurred, but they can be vivid too, and they can trigger long-lost associations. Only today, there suddenly came into my mind a forgotten name, just a name. It instantly summoned into my nostalgia a barrack room of some sort in Egypt long ago. I was among a group of foreign correspondents from all over the world, covering some Middle Eastern crisis or other, and with that misty name, some music came to me too. It was a popular song of the time, just one of those things, and it was jauntily sung with a fairly mangled lyric by Nate Poliwetsky of one of the news agencies, and I can see him now, in full performance, far away in time and place, half a lifetime ago. How we laughed, how we sang. That's what nostalgia can do. If you're still around, Nate Poliwetsky, sing that song again for me, will you? Day 46 I am happily susceptible to the abstraction the Welsh call hiraith. Dictionaries define it simply as longing, but to Welsh poets down the generations it has meant far, far more. The 14th century master Dafid ap Gwilym, for instance, declared it variously the son of memory, the son of intention, the son of grief, and the son of enchantment. Fortunately, the conception has always treated me kindly, and twice in the course of my daily exercise it has given me a moment of epiphany, a brief, lovely conviction that all would eventually be well, for me and for all others, as the old world turned again. And lo, it happened to me once more today, as I walked up our lane. I paused for a moment to take in the beauty of the morning, blue, blue sky, with soft and genial clouds, two high trails of aircraft hastening romantically to the west a dusting of snow on the mountains, 
a squawking of rooks somewhere, and fifty-nine sheep, I counted them, speckling the Paris fields all around. Eureka! Hereith! Day 52. A greeting card arrived the other day, picturing five cats, all in a row, two black and white, three tabbies. They stare back at me now. An honorary cat that I like to think myself, I am fascinated by the different expressions in their eyes. The black and white ones, which seem to be animals of the fluffy, bedroom slipper kind, appear conformist and look back at me without much interest. In the eyes of the three tabbies, though, there's an expression at once melancholy and eager, with a touch of the wild, perhaps. My family and I have lived with generations of cats, from reckless Siamese on our houseboat on the Nile to sturdy, extra-toed characters like Ernest Hemingway's in Key West. One among them all has looked back at me with an expression altogether different, the look of an equal. He was a Norwegian forest cat of a breed until recently unrecognised as a pedigree, no more than working farm cats. I named him Ibsen for his national origins. He was big and handsome and thoroughly decent, and until the day he died, I considered him a friend and a colleague. He was the last of our cats. We shall never have another. But I often think of him, and share a chuckle when I pass a road sign, half hidden by foliage, which has for months ineffectually tried to warn us of a missing traffic aid ahead. Warning, it appears to proclaim. No cats. Day 56. It is wonderful, isn't it? How insistently the experience of the first time loiters in the memory. When I was young, brash and short of cash, I mocked the pretensions of haute cuisine and all that. And when my love and I went for a holiday in France, we spent a week at a very modest pension in the hills of Haute-Savoie. The food was healthy, the wine was cheap, the people were charming, and it cost us practically nothing. You see, we said to each other, who needs more? On the way out of the mountains, though, at the end of our stay, I happened to notice a sign announcing the presence of a celebrated lakeside restaurant, which food snobs had bragged to me about. We had to admit it looked inviting. Oh, well, hell, we said to ourselves, just this once. And in we went. We ate a single dish of little fish fresh out of the lake with a bottle of Sancerre, crispy rolls and coffee to conclude. It cost us more than the entire bill for our week's stay at the pension, food, beds and all. It was my very first experience of a truly great French restaurant, and, mon Dieu, I have never looked back. Day 58 Don't you find that some memories stay in the mind far more clearly than others, more meaningfully, more allegorically, perhaps? One such memory for me concerns my very first flight in an aeroplane, which happened just about 70 years ago. Imagine! It was an ancient de Havilland Dragon Rapide biplane, born in the 1930s, and I'd hitched a ride from Cairo to Alexandria on a brilliant Egyptian summer's day. I remember the celestial space of it all up there, experienced for the very first time. All was blue and white around me. I remember the desert sand meeting the Azure Mediterranean far, far below. But what I remember most clearly of all was the moment when 
high above the delta, suddenly both the engines cut out. All was silence. But for creaking and the swoosh of the wind, and it did occur to me that I might be about to die. Dropping silently and ominously into Egypt, out of that splendid lucidity. But after a few minutes, the pilot turned round to me, just saving a bit of fuel, he shouted over his shoulder, before starting the engines again. And that moment has never left me. The irony of it, the shame, I really was frightened. The touch of comedy and the beauty, a brief instant, set against so glorious and fateful a landscape in so absolute a silence. When I recall the moment even now, I still feel some transcendental tremor, as if that pilot had himself been obeying the edict of some more senior captain, assessing me. I failed the test, I fear because of that moment of cowardice. But perhaps I've made up for it by remembering the moment to this very day with such a rich mixture of emotions. Day 63. If you're of a certain age, the most potently emotive volumes in your library are likely to be its old address books. All my life I've made a point of writing in my books when and where I bought each one, and these few thousand modest inscriptions, for example, in tiny fountain pen ink, Oxford, 1936, or in bolder felt tip, Jerusalem, 1947, stir my feelings to some degree. They are impotent, though, beside the entries in my successive discarded address books, faded, scribbled all over, sometimes in pencil, sometimes in blotched ink, with crossings out and amendments everywhere, outdated telephone numbers and half-legible street names and outdated married names and incomprehensible foreign reminders, sideways, upside down, and peering everywhere through the chaos are the names of my acquaintances down the years. I imagine them nervously awaiting their rediscovery or re-enactment, and they seem to me like so many neglected invalids, or even tattered ghosts. What became of W when last we parted? Oh, how touching, to see the repeated changes and corrections in one old friend's address, but how reassuring to find that another confidently recorded half a lifetime ago, hasn't shifted one iota since. It is a healthy corrective to my emotions, to realise that across the world there may be people idly looking through their own discarded telephone books to see what became of me. Day 65. The merry actress Debbie Reynolds has died. But with her name... One of my happier memories lives on. I never met her, but the star and studio system that had made her famous was in its prime when I first went to Hollywood. It was 1954, and I was buoyant myself with the international kudos of the successful Everest expedition the year before, which I had reported for the London Times in a much-publicised scoop. Because of Everest... I had introductions to many film people, and although I never met Reynolds herself, I see now that, in a sense, it was her Hollywood I encountered. Hardly had I landed there than I took tea with Mary Pickford, who was the grand dame of Hollywood in those days. She lived in immense grandeur, guarded by snooty aides, but turned out to be a most kindly old-school hostess, happily basking in her own legend. Almost as celestial was Walt Disney, who was just about to launch his world-changing Disneyland. And he went to great trouble explaining to me how his cartoon chipmunks conversed, in English, played extremely fast, backwards. 
All in all, then, I took to Hollywood 1954. Now that Debbie has left us, and her America too, I remember them one and all with fondness and sad admiration. Day 66 Yesterday, I realised that I lived in the best place on earth. It was a glorious evening of early winter, a time of wondrous colourings, golds and greys and vermilions and deepest blues, interspersed and overlaid by towering structures of white clouds, a majestic kind of evening, across which evening seabirds elegantly flew. Against this background, you must imagine our landscape. To our south, we see the Irish Sea in the evening tide, languidly rolling with its gentle line of spray, and beside it, the long, grey-blue line of the hills, speckled with farms and seashore houses away down towards Carmarthen and Pembrokeshire beyond, guarded by the proud silhouette of Harlech Castle, where Glendur of Wales fought the thievish English. Turn around now, look to the north. Higher by far and statelier are the mountains of Snowdonia, striding down to the bay across the water meadows of Glaslin. A more sombre green and brown those highlands are, with patches of slate, and in my heightened condition they seem to me to be playing solemn music up there, melodies drifting distantly around Snowdon itself, the home of the gods. You think I'm exaggerating the beauty of it all, and perhaps I am. But the true epiphany of that realisation last night was the burst of conviction that all around me that evening there lived a community of generally decent people. There were rogues down there, of course there were, and fools. But I've lived a lifetime in this place, among these people of northwest Wales, contemplating such prospects in varying conditions of despair or exaltation and I don't believe there's anywhere on earth better endowed with what I believe to be the ultimate beauty, the instinct of kindness. Day 68. Here's a laugh. I used to love the dear old London Times when I worked for it in the late years of its prime, and I still sometimes send things for publication in its letters page. They hardly ever get published but the unused ones are still extant in my computer, and here are a few of them. Sir, hooray, at last, not a single picture of animals in captivity among today's illustrations. Sir, I'm convinced my potted shrimps contain elements of seahorse. Sir, my Norwegian cat Ibsen and I are in love with each other. There is nothing carnal to this lifelong affection, and we already enjoy a very civil union. But we feel we would like to have the relationship given formal divine blessing. Is there any branch of any organised religion which would arrange such a ceremony? My dear friend Ibsen died in 2016. Without our union receiving any sacred blessing, even in Wales... Day 70. One of the pleasures of life, when you reach a certain age and are no longer keen on dinners, is one o'clock lunch. We have long made it a practice to eat it out somewhere, at a different place each day, and there are half a dozen local places we frequent. There is a grand old pub a mile up the road, where good white bait is served at the bar. And there is a decorous tea shop downtown in Cricketh, where I enjoy presenting agnostic arguments to its gently evangelical owner. The local fishing lakes serve waterside snacks. We can park the car at Tesco's while we eat toasted tea cakes at the cafe across the road. There's an original choice of light lunches at a restaurant in the next town along the coast, 
and the restaurant at our local garden centre seems to me an ideal example of Welsh capitalism. The seventh is showier than the rest, so we often skip it. But alas, it offers the best lunch of the lot. It is on our local waterfront, with a view of the castle, and the following is my own weekly favourite, a piping hot iron cauldron of local moule mariniere with rough fresh bread, a glass of Sauvignon Blanc and a large cappuccino to conclude. I sometimes feel like a second cauldron of mussels, showy or not, but no, I restrain myself for another week. Day 74. Scraped, torn and shabby, inside the door of my car, are two paperback volumes of Michel de Montaigne's collected essays. They live there permanently, and I love them. The moment I'm held up, because I'm waiting to meet somebody's train or because I've dropped Elizabeth off at the hairdressers, the moment I switch my engine off, ha! I scrabble happily for my Montaigne. The two old volumes were one volume once, but I tore it into two halves to get them into the door pocket, and they have a sort of brave, uncomplaining look to them that I find extra endearing. What do I feel like reading about while I wait? Liars? Idleness? Pedantry? The power of the imagination, war horses, all these, and a hundred more, are waiting there for my contemplation. But, better still, Michel is waiting there too, and there was never a more beguiling companion to share ideas with while the old Honda gratefully takes a breather. Day 77. I am big on premonitions. Nearly twenty years ago, I returned from a world journey feeling that something dire was about to happen to the world. The very next day, the World Trade Center in New York was attacked by terrorists, and we entered a new zeitgeist. It is not just a new spirit of the age that I sense is brewing now, it is a fundamental revision of all the ages, and we are witnessing now its very first elementary stirrings. It seems to me that during all our lifetimes, mankind has been unconsciously preparing itself for some immense renewal in the elimination of sexual differences, for example, in the gradual abolition of the nation-state, in the new command of cyberspace, and in the terrific revolution that is artificial intelligence, our own fateful step towards creation. And what does my premonition suggest to me about these colossal developments? Only this ignorant agnostic that I am. That surely there must be some almighty power, some soul with a vast eternal plan and that the final zeitgeist of all zeitgeists will then be unveiled for us, if ever we can master its meaning. Day 83. It was a fine, brisk, sunny morning when I went for my exercise along the promenade, and the whole beach was alive with dogs. Freed for once of their leads, they not only scampered all over the pebbles, chasing things, but actually rushed frenziedly into the incoming waves, emerging only to shake salt water all over their owners and sending children screaming out of range. As I leant on the railings above watching the scene, I thought, what a bore it must be to have to take those animals out for exercise each morning, to feed them 
and clear up their excrement. What a world away, I thought, from the civilization of the cats. But no. The more I looked at the faces around and below me, human and canine too, the more I realized that a genuine spirit of affection and even gratitude linked the species there. The children loved being splashed, and the dogs loved splashing them. The grown-ups retreated laughing from the spray and laughed up at me too to share the fun. I realized that I was witnessing an unwitting reconciliation of species, a shared celebration and a declaration of understanding. I went home thoughtfully then, remembering my late great love, our Norwegian forest cat, Ibsen, and wondering how happily, if push had come to shove, I would have taken him down to the beach on a lead to entertain the children and demonstrate our comedy. I would have despaired. He would have hissed or pissed. Or both. Day 91. Our modest and crumbling house, Trefan Maurice, is just about as old as the United States of America. But has this to be said for it? It has its fill of curiosities. Here are some of them. Stand back. Scores of model ships of many kinds, materials and nationalities, are scattered throughout its rooms, and they include a large steamship flying the fated flag of the free city of Danzig, 1920-39, and the greengrocer's barge from which we used to buy our groceries when we lived in Venice, and a wooden New York tug built, it says on the bottom, by Colonel Wilsey Dubois, and an Arab dhow, and a Faroe Islands fishing boat, and a Bristol Channel pilot boat. Framed in our library is a manuscript of the poem The Country Clergy, written for me in his own hand by the greatest of modern Welsh poets, R.S. Thomas, died 2000. All members of my immediate family are represented by miscellaneous works of art strewn through the house from one end to the other, and under the stairs a slate dutifully awaits the departure of Jan and Elizabeth Morris, which says at the end of one life. When it will be placed with happy ceremonial, I hope, on an islet we possess in the nearby river Duivor. And finally, several million books are embedded and entangled, as it were, in the very character, psyche and ethos of Trefan Maurice. I have read them all and written most of them. Day 111. For seventy-odd years I have lived in love and in life with my beloved friend Elizabeth. And only now is that subtle demon of our time, dementia, coming between us. She does not read these thoughts of mine, does not now read much, really, and the scope of our conversation becomes narrower month by month. She can still summon her old charm for outsiders, but uh, saves her irritations for me. And here's the subtlety of that damned demon. I know very well that her forgetfulness, her irritation, her narrowing interests are in no way her fault. I know it perfectly well, and I understand. But dementia brings out the worst in me, too. It incites me to harshness and impatience and to say unpleasant things. But here's a saving grace. I do not mean those calumnies, and Elizabeth knows it. Kindness reconciles us still, and in all our long years together, in life as in love, we have not once said good night without the sweet kiss of reconciliation. Day 116. 
I have been ill, hospitalized, bed-bound at home, enduring the queer delusions that can accompany kidney failures, and feeling thoroughly sorry for myself. The kindest administrations of family, neighbors, and friends have carried me through, and today, at last, praise God, I'm going to drive my car again. How faithfully it has been standing out there in the yard, waiting for the summons. My dear old Honda Civic Type R, 2006 vintage, and still the elderly boy racer's dream, with the leaves of autumn on its bonnet and the summer sunshine crinkling them. An old friend, only waiting for a turn of the ignition key at last. Oh, dear, what if... But no, the battery's fine. The handbrake's off. The six gears eagerly await my orders. I fasten my belt, and with the appropriate snarl, we're off skidding out of the yard, through the rickety gates, through the farmyard, up the bumpy drive, and like Mr. Toad before me, I'm away. Away! Day 126. The longer I live, the more I love my library. And this is lucky, because it is a terrible time waster. I enjoy nothing more than just pottering about in it, picking out a volume now and then, simply to renew its acquaintance, or in the hope of finding a letter from an old friend tucked in its pages, or to remind myself of a phrase I remember with particular pleasure, or an observation that maddened me forty years ago. Now that I've half withdrawn from the world, what an infinite pleasure to have such a host of old associates in the house. As I've always written in them, where I got them and when, they've become an intimate kind of record of my life. As a visitor to our house observed long years ago, they're like so many friends sitting there in their stacks, and they have matured or declined along with me. And if they're often out of date, well, bless their hearts. So am I. Day 148. I have a feeling that the British, deprived of their old confidence and self-satisfaction, may soon be nostalgic for their lost empire. For so long an epitome of political incorrectness, I have spent much of my life investigating and commemorating the old Raj. And long ago became convinced that, although we now realise there was much that was deplorable in the very idea of imperialism, everyone knows that, in its British interpretation, there was much to be proud of, too. The Empire certainly offered many perfectly decent British citizens enjoyable and worthwhile lives. At the top end of the scale were those whose careers quite plainly benefited everyone, rulers and ruled alike, doctors and nurses, engineers, scientists of many kinds, enlightened civil servants, teachers and geographers and soldiers devoted to their men, whatever their race, Geordies or Sikhs or Africans or Maoris. There were hundreds of thousands of such useful British imperialists across a quarter of the world. Just a thought. But when the British, and particularly the English among them, ever get over their present condition of perpetual self-denigration, perhaps they will be able to look back at their imperial years with more pride to their apologies, and even, yes, a touch of nostalgia.
Day 149. My eldest brother, Gareth, 1920 to 2007, was an eminent and scholarly professional flautist who was also, off stage as it were, a virtuoso siffleur, a whistler. He was particularly proud of his whistled performance of Paganini's Perpetua Mobile, and he whistled all his life until his embouchure was damaged by a mugger in New York, and he could whistle no more. I am a whistler too, though I chiefly whistle to rhythmic purpose as I do my daily thousand-pace walk. I was delighted to learn the other day that another putative relative of mine was an accomplished whistler, Albert Payne, otherwise known as A. Ehrlich, was an Anglo-German music publisher in Leipzig at a time when my mother, Enid Payne, was a student at the conservatoire there. He played the violin very well, I read in a contemporary memoir, but his real genius lay in whistling. Hmm. I'm told that A. Ehrlich's classic book, Celebrated Violinists Past and Present, 1897, is still in print. But it's Celebrated Whistlers Down the Centuries, I would like to read. So perhaps I'd better write it. Day 154. For the first time in my life. I was taken up the mountain railway yesterday to the top of our neighbouring peak, Snowdon, Erwidva, the highest in Wales or England. I enjoyed the experience immensely, but not in the way I expected. The line is closing for the winter. Ours was the very last train on the timetable, and the whole venerable apparatus of the railway which was built by Swiss engineers in 1864, was jam-packed with a jostling, eager, multi-age, multi-race crowd. The journey up was familiar enough to me, but still magnificent in its scale and landscape. But whereas, when I have wandered Erwitfa alone, I have felt myself to be in an empty world. Whenever I looked out of the window from that train, somewhere down there, laboriously plodding up tracks, widely scattered across all flanks of the mountain, even scudding down it on bikes, were the thousands of other people who were with us on Snowdon that morning. Then we reached the end of the line and tumbled out into a mist and into a strange, huge chamber which is actually a cafe jammed with a cheerful, amazed demonstration of humanity, eating sandwiches, everyone talking at once. Near the ceiling of the room, which itself remains something of a dream to me, there was a long window, and through it I could see dim, burly human figures clambering here and there in the mist. In fact, they were climbing the last few feet to the summit of Snowdon, to the cairn of stones at the very top. But they looked to me like initiates on some mystic mission to achieve an ultimate destination before themselves, fading into the fog. So I felt a little mystic myself as I started on the last of my sausage roll, but then a loudspeaker warned us that the final train was about to leave for the journey back to reality, so I gobbled it down, fast. Day 158 Here's a little private parable. Its text comes from a New Yorker cartoon by the late James Thurber, concerning some not very good wine, a wine without breeding, as he called it. But I think you'll be amused by its presumption. Years ago, when I was young, I accompanied as a reporter the first expedition ever to climb Mount Everest. It made me a minor celebrity and when a few years later the first flights to the moon were planned, it seemed to me that I was the obvious reporter to go with them. Because of Everest, I was well known for my experience in such adventurous projects. I had a high opinion of my own descriptive powers, and 
I only awaited the call. Imagine the cheek of it. Think of how astronauts really are recruited, the infinite care with which they are chosen, the months of training and indoctrination, the psychological requirements, the courage and dedication and technical skill. The call never came, and a good thing too. I was by no means unassuming, unlike Thurber's wine, and looking back upon myself now, I really cannot pardon my presumption. Moral? Know thyself, for heaven's sake. Day 173. One morning in 1956, when my family and I lived on our houseboat, Safir, on the Nile in Cairo, the mail turned up as we were having breakfast on the deck with a visiting guest. It included a package from London, and when I opened it with rising excitement, I found it to contain the very, very first copy of my very, very first book, Coast to Coast, Faber and Faber, 271 pages, 21 shillings. Our guest watched my pleasure as I unwrapped it, and then laughingly said, As long as you live, you'll never have another moment quite like this. Well, she was wrong. This morning, half a century on, when we sat at our luncheon table in Wales, there arrived in the mail my very first copy of my very latest book, Battleship Yamato. Palace Athena, 112 pages, £9.79. I have published 40-odd books by now. A couple are on the stocks and Faber's are waiting to publish another posthumously. But the unwrapping of Yamato has excited me just as much today as did the arrival of Coast to Coast all those years ago. And so has every single one of those books since then. Day 178. The News from America. I woke up today with a challenging bump. Whom do I trust? Is it Bannon or Trump? Who is this wolf who has written that book? Tillis and Kushner, are they worth a look? Should I stick with the Times for reliable views, or is Twitter the place to keep up with the news? And where's Uncle Sam half awake, I inquire? Why on earth is he floundering there in the mire? I had no reply, so went back to my sleep. To hell with it all. It will keep, it will keep. Day 179 The news from London. I got up this morning and heard something sinister. Plotters had plots to remove our Prime Minister. Some were against her because of her Brexit. Others, bad rhymers, called her dyslexic. <laughs> they claimed that our nation could never be great if she was commanding the ship of the state and said that her running of the economy might well have come straight out of old Deuteronomy. From the Bible, they meant, as much as to say, that all was too much for poor Mrs. May. And to tell you the truth, I am not at all sure which opinion is phony, which judgment is pure. So over my breakfast I'd rather recall when we thought our poor country the greatest of all, and then I shall sing while my coffee's still hot, Britain, Britannia, the best of the lot. Day 182. On my recent birthday... My beloved son, Tom, and his love, Gwyneth, wrote for me a celebratory song entitled Kindness and Marmalade, recognising that those two commodities have played crucial parts in my life. During half a lifetime of travel, I took a pot of marmalade wherever I went, in war as in peace, in pleasure as in frenzy. In 1953, I took a jar of Cooper's Oxford to assist my reportage of the first ascent of Mount Everest. Now that I'm mostly at home in Wales, as Tom and Gwyneth recognised, I've not neglected the old loyalty. By now, I admit, there's an element of superstition to my marmaladia. Seven jars are aligned on our kitchen dresser, one for each day of the week, and each is different. 
I eat from them in strict order, Monday to Sunday, and just occasionally I get the day wrong, and my toast gets marmalade from Tinawith, say, when it should be from kafir to thin, or vice versa. Then again, I admit to moments of faithlessness in occasionally enjoying barbarisms like lemon or even whiskey flavourings in my marmalades. Such heresies must expect retaliation unless I expiate them by sincere apologies to the marma gods. But they're sure to forgive me anyway. Their congregations are none too large, and they can hardly afford to be vindictive. Day 188 A day in old age. Here's how it went. I decided yesterday that I would have my dear old car professionally washed and cleaned, for the first time, as it happens, during the long, happy years of our association, I'd prefer a well-worn Honda. So, after breakfast, I drove along the coast to our nearest town with my dear Elizabeth, and we dropped it off with some agreeable Poles who run a car-washing business. We then walked the half-mile or so to a pleasant restaurant we know to have some lunch. It was closed. So we walked another mile or so to another coffee shop for a snack instead. While we were there, I discovered my credit card was missing, so we hurried back to the car washes to see if I'd left it there. I hadn't. So we walked another five miles across town to the local branch of my bank, to get some cash to pay the car washers with, and then retraced our steps back to the closed restaurant in case I had dropped the card on the way. I hadn't. So we walked back the ten miles to the coffee shop, and while I emptied my bag and wallet in a last search for the card, my beloved Elizabeth looked in her bag and found it had been there all the time. We walked in salt silence the twenty-five miles back to the car wash place, where the Poles were very welcoming and gave me back my car. It looked unnaturally new, but never mind. It will soon look itself again. We must all recognise our ages, must we not? We ended the day delightfully, with mussels and white wine by the sea. And so, to bed. <laughs>